so good to be with you all. Thank you for, for coming this morning. Um, so I'm going to speak for about half an hour and I'm going to cover uh, kind of two issues. The first is going to be some of the material from the divide, focusing on um, what's happening with, glo with global poverty and inequality and what some of the underlying structural drivers are. Um, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about post-growth and degrowth. Uh, these, these might seem a bit disconnected, but they're in fact, um, they link quite closely uh, and maybe that will emerge a little bit in the discussion that follows. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, just give me a second. Since so much of what I have to say here is visual. Okay, um, so I want to begin with this like sort of very simple question, and that is how bad is global is global poverty really? Um, this is something that we all feel that we know quite well because there's a very powerful discourse out there about about global uh, about global poverty and how it's um, it's been improving so dramatically over the past few decades. Uh, this graph shows the, um, the number of people in the world who live under $1.90 per day, okay? Um, and this is, uh, this data actually only goes to 2010, but, um, uh, but, but these days it's a bit lower. It's, it's now just under 1 billion people, okay? So it's continued to improve a little bit. Um, and this, this narrative of declining poverty, you know, since the World Bank began uh, collecting data on this in 1981, um, has, be, has become very powerful and has been invoked quite frequently to, to sort of justify um, and celebrate the status quo of the global economy and specifically neoliberal globalization, which has been enforced since the early 1980s, okay? And we hear this narrative from figures like Steven Pinker, from Hans Rosling, from Bill Gates very, very frequently, uh, from Nicholas Kristof, who every year writes an article about how the world is better than ever before, and um, from uh, Max Roser at, the, at Our World in Data. Um, and just to give you a sense for how this narrative plays kind of in the media, um, this is a paragraph from The Spectator a couple of years ago. Um, this was actually just after the, the conclusion of the Millennium Development Goals. And it reads, it reads as follows, right, right now we're living through the golden age of poverty reduction. Anyone serious about tackling glo global poverty must accept that whatever we're doing now, it's working, so we should keep doing it. We're on the road to an incredible goal, the end of poverty as we know it within our lifetime. Those who care more about helping the poor than hurting the rich will celebrate this fact and urge leaders to make sure that free trade and global capitalism keep spreading. It's the only true way to make poverty history. Um, now, crucially, this, uh, this piece was published um, at exactly the time when you know, Bernie, you know, Bernie Sanders was, was becoming a big deal, just as Pope Francis was coming out against global inequality, just as Jeremy Corbyn was making noise about global inequality, et cetera, et cetera. There's kind of this rise of critique, you know, this is after Piketty's book, this rise of critique of inequality um, and how capitalism is generating, you know, inequality. And, um, and the backlash was, wait, you know, stop complaining about the way the global economy works. Clearly it's, it's ending poverty. And so, and that's what we should care most about. So it's working, okay. And so it's, it, it was kind of this, this mediating uh, effects on, on the, the inequality critical discourse. But there really are a number of crucial problems with this narrative, and I'm going to go over just a couple of them uh, really briefly. The first is that virtually all of these gains against global, global poverty come from one place. And probably if you think about it for a second, you can guess where that place is. Um, it's China. And the reason this is important is because China uh, um, has, has never followed Washington consensus policies. And so, it, and so gains in China um, against poverty cannot be claimed as part of a pro-neoliberal globalization um, narrative, right? So the rest of the world was, you know, the rest of the global south was structurally adjusted um, in the 1980s, 1990s by the World Bank and the IMF and the U.S. Treasury. Uh, China was not structurally adjusted along with, um, you know, the East Asian tigers and their economic success um, uh, is due to a fundamentally different cocktail of policies that are effectively Keynesian in orientation, right? Protectionist and, Keyns and Keynesian. Of course, China has liberalized, but it's liberalized crucially on its own terms with a significant amount of state guidance. Um, uh, right, and in fact, in fact, uh, crucially, a lot of China's policies, a lot of China's um, economic policies have been have been slandered by the very people that celebrate the, the poverty narrative. Right, so people like Bill Gates utterly hates China's economic policies because they prevent them from. Um, um, so, if we take China out of the equation, then we get the green line here. Uh, again, I have to update this data, but but um, but this shows you that. You know, um, there's been, you know, outside of China, there's been basically no change in the number of people living um, in, global, in, in poverty since 1981. It's roughly exactly the same today as it was, uh, in, you know, 40 years ago. 
Okay. Uh, the second problem with the, with the narrative is that the, um, the line that's used here, the dollar ninety day line, is entirely arbitrary. Uh, this might seem surprising to you given its ubiquity, uh, but in reality, this is very striking. Actually, there's no empirical basis for this figure in terms of its ability to meet actual human needs. Right. Um, uh, there's none, the, and this is remarkable, and it was pointed out recently by the UN Special Rapporteur on, on uh, uh, extreme poverty and human rights. Um, some of the problems with the, with the, with the, with the dollar 90 day, day line are as follows. Basically, um, the, inter the international poverty line, which is what it's called, underestimates poverty routinely compared to national poverty lines in virtually every case. Um, just to take a recent example, Mexico, according to the, the dollar 90 day line, um, only 5% of Mexicans are in poverty, right, which seems remarkable. Um, according to Mexico's own national poverty line, it's about 50 to 80 percent, depending on rural or urban areas. Um, and that's according to the previous conservative government. Okay, uh, it's in, it's over and over again. Uh, studies find that a dollar ninety is insufficient for basic human survival. In in, in India, children living in fact, you know, in families just above the poverty line, have a 60 percent chance of being underweight. Um, I could I could run through dozens of statistics like this that show that. Uh, that you know, life is misery on a dollar ninety, and it's important to remember here that um, that uh, that we're talking here about uh, purchasing power parity, uh, parity values, which means that what's at stake here is adult, is what a dollar ninety a day can buy in the United States. Okay, so this is not what an American could buy in Sudan with a with a dollar ninety American dollars, which might be quite a lot. This is rather what an American could buy in America with a dollar ninety a day. Okay, which is you know, virtually nothing, maybe a loaf of bread, okay? Um, so to give you a sense for what this is like, um, according to David Woodward, a UN economist, um, it would be like, sorry, it would be like 35 people trying to survive on a single minimum wage with no benefits of any kind, no gifts, borrowing, scavenging, or savings to draw on because all of these are actually included as income in these poverty calculations. This is not just, uh, just uh, monetary income that we're talking about. This is total consumption. This is what's represented in total consumption, okay? So um, that includes things you might get from your vegetable garden. So scholars routinely insist that we need a higher poverty line that's more empirically based. And, and these are what some of the empirical estimates of the poverty line look like. So Peter Edward argues that um, he demonstrates you need about 740 a day to achieve normal human life expectancy of just over 70 years. Uh, the US Food and Drug Administration itself estimates that people need about $6.70 to achieve basic human nutrition, okay? The New Economics Foundation in London estimates that you need about $8 to reduce infant mortality by a meaningful, by a meaningful margin. The World Bank itself uh, has routinely said that between six dollars and seven fifty per day is more accurate for most regions in terms of understanding an, emp an empirically grounded uh, conception of poverty. And um, famous economists like Lent Pritchett, uh, Pritchett at Harvard and Charles Kenny at the Center for Global Development, neither of these are radical left-wing think tanks, argue that that, it, that the poverty line should be set um, at fifteen dollars a day, which represents um, roughly what poverty is in the United States. If you're going to use U.S. purchasing power values then you should use the US poverty line, right? Which is again, is empirically based, okay? So what happens if we measure global poverty at sort of the mid range of these more empirical estimates? Um, the story changes quite a lot. And here we have the blue line at 740 a day. Uh, this is Peter Edwards line. And what we see is that uh, there was in fact a dramatic increase in the number of people living in poverty in the 1980s and 1990s during the structural adjustment period in the global south, right? Um, as neoliberalism was imposed uh, in, in quite radical forms, uh, more or less forcibly by the World Bank and the IMF. It's leveled off a little bit since then um, as structural adjustment conditions have lightened up a little bit um, and, and also as the commodity boom uh, got underway in the, in the 21st century, okay? But today it stands at about 4.2, 4.3 billion people living um, under the empirical poverty line uh, which is around 60% of the human population. So the story this tells is clearly that, you know, um, the global economy is not working for the majority of humanity. Uh, in fact, it's failing, right? Now, um, of course, we should recognize that people's incomes have increased um, by very, very small amounts, however, uh, enough to lift them above these very low poverty thresholds, but not enough to get, to get them out of poverty um, according to any empirical definition. So we're, we're looking at income increases about, uh, um, you know, daily incomes increasing about two cents per year, okay, the past 40 years, which is virtually nothing, especially when you consider the explosion of incomes at the top. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, so if you take China out of the equation, this is what the, this is what the figure looks like. 
um, we see a steady rise over the entire period in the number of people living in poverty. In terms of percentages, excluding China, then it hovers at about 60% um, over the entire period. Okay. Uh, so not, not much change at all, really. This data goes to 2013. What about, what about global inequality? Is global inequality getting better or worse? Again, here there's a narrative that's become quite powerful in the World Bank that suggests that globalization has actually reduced inequality. And to justify that narrative, um, uh, they, they, they use data like this. This is what's known as the elephant graph. And this shows basically that, okay, if we look at the bottom axis, we see this is, um, this is income groups in the world by percentile. So the poorest 10% on the left, uh, the richest 1% on the right, and, um, and on the y-axis, uh, this is the, um, the change in their income over this period from 1980 to 2016, okay? This data comes from the World Inequality Database. What we see is that the, the, the biggest positive change in income has happened among the poor, okay? So among the poorest 40, 50%, basically. The richest 1%, of course, have gained quite a lot, um, but, uh, but the biggest chunk has, has actually been gained uh, among the global poor. And so this would seem to, to validate the claim that, that globalization is working well for the poor. Now, um, if you pay attention to this graph long enough, you'll quickly uh, recognize there's a bit of a problem, and that is that, um, that be, be, you know, these are relative changes in income, which means that if you start from a very low base, like a dollar a day, then a 100% increase in your income moves you to $2 a day. Uh, whereas if you start from a much higher base, such as, uh, you know, $100,000 a year, then a, um, you know, just a mere 20 or 30 percent increase in your income uh, is an additional 20 or 30,000 US dollars, right? So, so a much bigger absolute gap opens up, despite the fact that the relative gap, um, that relatively incomes in the bottom half are, are increasing faster, okay? So what does it look like in absolute terms, and if we think about the absolute gap? This is what we see in terms of the absolute distribution of new income from global growth. We see that over the past 40 years, uh, the poorest 50% um, of humanity have gained virtually nothing. Uh, almost all gains from global growth have gone to the richest, um, the richest uh, two or three decile, deciles, and the richest 1% have gained uh, an absolutely astronomical amount of new income from global growth. So, uh, so this is not trickle down. I mean, I mean, you know, the the richest 1% appropriate about 25% of all new income from growth. The richest 5% uh, um, appropriate nearly, nearly half of all new income from global growth, if, if you can imagine. The poorest 60% get about 5% of it, uh, just to give you a perspective on this. So, um, so, when, so when we think about the global economy as a single um, operating unit, then it becomes clear that new income produced by that economy goes vastly disproportionately to the very top. Now, what about inequality between countries? Again, we have this narrative that, you know, the global south is catching up to the north, the gap, you know, the old colonial gap is being closed. Um, is this true or not? Well, World Bank data tells a quite different story. Um, uh, this is what we see uh, in, in terms of um, real GDP per capita. We see that, uh, okay, so on the top here, we have the US, Germany, France, the UK, OECD, the European Union as a whole, representing effectively the global north. And then we have all regions of the global south in the bottom here. Um, in, including a line for China. Um, so what we see here is that uh, there has been no convergence, there has been no catch up. In fact, the, the real per capita income gap between the global north and the global south has roughly quadrupled in size since the end of colonialism. Okay, which is striking because again, our, our narrative would suggest otherwise. Okay. Um, so why is this happening? Just very briefly here, uh, you know, people always want to know what about all the aid, you know, we have this discourse that the global north gives tremendous amounts of aid to the global south, um, you know, so benevolently, so, so, so why, why isn't that working? Well, um, if we pay attention to the way that flows work around the world, we see that there's a much more complex picture at stake. Um, each year developing countries receive about two trillion dollars in total inflows. Uh, from the global north, right? Now, that's not just aid, that's also foreign investments, loans, remittances, everything. Uh, but in the same, at the same time, um, some $5 trillion flows out of them the other direction, right? Which means that, um, that $3 trillion per year flows from, uh, in net terms, flows from south to north. Now, if you compare that to the aid budget, then what you see is that for every dollar of aid the South receives, they lose $24 in net outflows. Now, of course, for some countries, it's much bigger than this, and for other countries, it's much smaller. Uh, but on average, that's, that's the way that it works. 
So there's a huge net flow of resource of financial resources from the south to the north. So 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 what causes that? What what comprises that net outflow? Um, I'll just go over a couple of um, the flows here uh, for um, for reference. So the aid budget is 130 billion dollars per per year from north to south. But in the, at the same time, you know, um, uh, we have data showing that the global south loses about 60 billion dollars per year in extra patent licensing fees under the intellectual property rights agreements in the WTO, okay? So that's needing to pay for things like, you know, uh, patent licensing on medicines and technologies that they didn't have to pay before th these rules came in place, which basically extend American corporate patents um, to ridiculous levels. Uh, so Global South countries lose about 200 billion per year in interest payments, interest payments alone on external debt. Um, many of these debts have been paid off many times over, but thanks to the miracle of compound interest, they're still due, effectively. Some of them were accumulated by dictators long since deposed. Some of those dictators were, were actually imposed in the first place by Western powers. Um, but the point here is that um, these payments on, on external debt um, vastly outstrip the flow of aid that comes in, in the first place, right? In and of itself. Uh, Global South countries also lose about f a little less than $500 billion per year in repatriated profits. This is multinational companies that operate in Global South countries that then shift their profits back, uh, back home, right? Uh, so those profits do not provide any meaningful uh, reinvestment in the host country itself. That, out that actually outstrips the, the, the total quantity of foreign direct investment that Global South countries receive. Um, more is taken out of them in profit rep repatriation than comes into them in, for in terms of FDI, which, which, is, which is crazy to think about. Uh, not in every year, but in most years, it's about that. Um, Global South countries lose about $875 billion per year in trade misinvoicing. This data comes from Global Financial Integrity. Um, this is basically a form of tax evasion practiced by multinational companies primarily um, through, the, through the trade system. Uh, they, they lose another roughly $875 billion per year in abusive transfer pricing. This is when multinational companies uh, shift profits between their branches in different countries to take advantage of low tax jurisdictions. Again, a form of tax evasion that also starves global south countries of, um, of uh, finance for reinvestment. Okay? These are huge outflows that vastly outstrip the flow of, of, of aid and foreign investment. Um, at the same time, you know, the global south suffers a number of structural losses. Uh, UN data shows that they lose about $1.5 trillion per year in, uh, in potential export revenues due to unfair WTO rules, okay? Like, these are revenues they would have been making um, uh, had trade been fairer. And they, they lose about, uh, well, they suffer costs of about 500, well, in the last year of data, $571 billion um, associated with climate breakdown, right? So, so here, I mean, this is, this is wild to think about, but the, 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 the consequences of climate breakdown cost more than Global South countries receive in aid, okay? Uh, by quite a long ways. Um, there's also a significant amount of appropriation of resources from the Global South. This is work I've been doing recently, um, which is coming out shortly. But each year, the Global North appropriates a net total of 12 billion tons of raw materials and 392 billion hours of human labor, right, uh, through trade. Now, this is, a, this is a net appropriation, which means more resources and labor are flowing from the South to the North than the other way around, right? So there's a monetary trade balance but a physical trade imbalance, which means that, um, which is enabled by price differentials in the, in the global economy, which enables the North to appropriate a, a, an extraordinary mass of resources and labor from the South each year for free, right? Um, so how much is that worth? Well, in, um, in the last year of data that I have in 2015, it was worth about 4 trillion US dollars at, glo at global average prices, right? So, you know, this, these, this data really changes the narrative, I think. Um, it becomes clear that, you know, rich countries are not developing poor countries. Poor countries are, in fact, developing rich countries, as they have been ever since the onset of colonialism. So global inequality really should not be a surprise to us. I mean, the system is, um, the global economy is working precisely as it was designed to do, which is to enrich uh, the core of the world system at the expense primarily of the periphery, okay? Um, now, why does this happen? It happens because of entrenched power imbalances in the global economy. So if you take the World Bank and the IMF, for instance, I mean, these institutions um, are the key institutions that control uh, the rules of the international economy, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, the G8 has, uh, has a vastly disproportionate share of the voting power in these institutions. The USA has a veto in both institutions over major decisions. The entire global South, which has 85% of the world's population, has a good deal less than 50% of the vote in these, in these key institutions, right? So, so really, you know, in the World Bank and IMF, there's a form of global apartheid that operates 
um, if this if this operated in any national context, we would cry foul. It, it would clearly be racist, um, and yet somehow we accept it uh, in terms of the governance of the global economy without asking any questions about it. Uh, the World Trade Organization is, has similar problems. It's technically one nation, one vote, but in reality, uh, bargaining power is determined by market size. And what that means, as you can imagine, is that the countries that grew rich during the colonial period and have the biggest GDP as a consequence um, are now able to determine the rules of international trade in their own interests, right? So this is why we have these price imbalances that allow, um, that allow the global north to appropriate such a mass of resources and labor from the south each year, okay? Um, so uh, just to reiterate here, uh, we know empirically that the poorest 60% of humanity contribute the majority of the resources, the energy, the land, and the labor that go into the global economy. I mean, look around you at the stuff that is in your home uh, that you consume each day. Where, where does that stuff come from, right? And yet, they receive only 5% of new income from global growth, right? So <laughs> this just gives you a sense for how deeply imbalanced the, the contributors and the receivers are of the global economy. We have to keep that in mind. Now, let me shift gears here briefly to talk about, um, to talk about uh, the ecology side of this question. Um, I want to begin uh, with this image here, which is an image of, uh, of the planetary boundary framework, probably the most important recent development in ecological science. And what it shows is, um, is the pressure that humanity uh, is exerting on key Earth system processes vis-a-vis uh, -vis what scientists consider to be safe thresholds or boundaries in the Earth system. So, and it's not just climate change. Climate change is a major one. As you can see, um, climate change here is in yellow, which is, in, which is past the planetary boundary in terms of concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. But, uh, but biosphere integrity, which is basically um, biodiversity collapse or species extinction rates, is way beyond the threshold in a zone of dangerous uncertainty. And that's represented by the red. Um, so too with land system change, uh, this is basically deforestation and conversion to agriculture, which causes soil depletion, biodiversity loss, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, biogeochemical flows, this is effectively chemical runoff uh, from industrial agriculture, specifically, uh, most intensively from beef, from, uh, from land converted for beef farming, right? Um, so again, you know, our, our, our crisis is not just climate change. We're looking at deforestation uh, rates of soil depletion that are highly concerning um, in terms of future harvests. Ma massive ocean dead zones that sprawl across the coastlines of industrialized nations, um, collapsing fish stocks virtually everywhere in the world, uh, insect die-offs, which have become very serious in Europe over the past um, uh, couple of years, couple of decades, species extinction rates that are now, that are now uh, around a thousand times faster than the, than the normal background rate. Um, scientists consider this, this to be uh, um, driving what, what they refer to as the sixth mass extinction in our planet's history. And then of course, climate breakdown, um, which is the one we're all focused on. Uh, so one of the ways that we, that we tabulate the, um, uh, these, these total impacts is through a measure known as global material footprint. Now this is basically an indicator that um, tallies up all of the weight of the material stuff that humanity uh, extracts and consumes every year. And you know, that adds everything from petroleum to, uh, to forests, to fish, to plastics. Um, etc. And what we see is that um, there's been uh, a steady rise in material extraction and consumption over the past, well, over all of uh, capitalist history, um, but specifically accelerating in the past couple of decades, right? So the, the red line here is 50 billion tons. This is um, a, a high level of what ecological scientists consider to be safe. Um, that was exceeded in the late 1990s. There was some talk at the time that you know, with, with improving technologies and a shift of services, we, we may be able to continue to grow GDP while, um, while resource use declines, but in fact, that has not happened. On the contrary, there's been an acceleration in total global material use uh, for reasons we can discuss. Now, this is very tightly coupled to GDP. Um, I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, again, there was, there was some hope there would be a decoupling, but in fact, the, on, on, on the contrary, the opposite has happened. There's been a kind of recoupling or rematerialization of the global economy over the past 20 years, despite a massive shift to, uh, to services and to the knowledge economy and to IT, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so uh, and the coupling between these two is very tight and um, is uh, extremely difficult to break if, um, and possibly impossible. 
Now, crucially, um, this overshoot of ecological boundaries is due almost entirely to overconsumption in rich countries, right? So the, the, the narrative of the, of the Anthropocene actually has it wrong. It suggests that all humans are equally responsible for this uh, crisis when in fact, um, in fact, that's not true. Uh, it's down to a couple of, uh, a couple of countries. Um, this gives you an indication of what this looks like. Um, when we look at material footprint per capita in different nations by income group, we see that low income nations consume about two, uh, two or three tons of stuff per person per year. Um, similar in lower middle income nations, upper middle income nations consume just about at the boundary, which is about seven tons of stuff per year. And high income nations is way out of whack, about 28 material tons of stuff. The USA and Australia is about 35, to give you a sense. Um, uh, Romania is um, in the region of 16. Uh, so, um, so high levels of overshoot in, in higher income countries. Now, crucially, the consequences of this overshoot um, uh, in resource terms uh, hit the South disproportionately. Uh, now, um, to understand how that works, I want, I want you to, to think back to the, to the point about net appropriation of resources I made earlier. Um, basically, about half of material consumption in high-income nations is net appropriated from the global south. And, and what that means is that the, um, the impacts of excess consumption in the north um, actually occur, are inflicted on, as it were, in the south, right? So um, beef consumption in the USA, for example, drives deforestation in the Amazon. Um, uh, if, if you're building a bunch of electric cars in Switzerland, that's uh, driving, you know, lithium mining uh, um, in, in Bolivia and the Andes, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it's really the South where the vast majority of the ecological impacts actually happen. Something similar is happening in terms of climate change. Um, this graph is derived from research I, I recently published in The Lancet, uh, showing, um, showing historical responsibility for climate breakdown. Now this is national emissions in excess of what scientists consider to be the safe planetary boundary of 350 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, okay? Um, uh, we see that uh, uh, of all global excess emissions over that threshold, the USA is responsible for 40% of them, single-handedly, one nation. Um, the European Union is responsible for 29%. The Global North as a group is responsible for no less than 92% of total excess emissions, right? The Global South, which includes all of the, all of the, the continents of Latin America, um, uh, Africa, and Asia, uh, has contributed only 8% of excess emissions. If it were not for excess consumption in the North, we would not be in a climate crisis. We would not be in an ecological um, overshoot crisis either, okay? This is crucial. Um, and yet, uh, the South suffers 92% of, of the costs of, of climate breakdown in terms of um, damages and economic costs, and 98% of the total deaths generated by, um, by climate breakdown, right? So a, a vastly disproportionate um, relationship here between cause and effects. Now, what does all of this mean for international developments? Well, the first thing I want to say is that poor countries um, are effectively the easy part. Now, to me, this reverses the discourse of international development. Over the past however many decades, the argument has been that poor countries are the problem, and um, it's very difficult to solve poverty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in fact, poor countries are not the problem, <laughs> um, uh, and it's not difficult to solve poverty. Uh, and it's, it's also not difficult, in fact, uh, to, to have flourishing lives for all within planetary boundaries, right? This is simple to achieve. We know how to do it. It's, it's already been done. There are existing models that show this can be done. And examples are, for example, like Costa Rica. Um, so Costa Rica uh, has extremely high levels of human well-being and social outcomes, you know, higher life expectancy than the USA and, and higher than, than many other highly developed countries, including um, Romania by quite a long ways actually, uh, and, and yet is, entirely, is almost entirely within planetary boundaries on all fronts, right? This is remarkable. How do they do it? The answer is simple, uh, robust, universal um, public health care, education, and social security. It's simple. Um, this was possible because progressive governments in Costa Rica <coughs> from the middle of the, 20th, of the 20th century were rolling out um, these progressive policies that ensured uh, a, you know, a good life for all. Um, in most other countries in the South where that was being done at the same time, uh, all of that was reversed by structural adjustment programs that dismantled universal healthcare and education systems and social security, right, um, through privatization, et cetera, et cetera. Costa Rica managed to escape that fate for particular historical reasons that we, could, that we can discuss later. Um, but rich countries, I argue, are, 
are the hard part. They are the real problem when it comes to international development because they're the ones driving ecological breakdown. And they're the hard part when it comes to thinking about how to solve the problem because we know that they need to dramatically scale down emissions and material throughput. And that has never been done before, okay? Outside of recessions, that's never been done before. So this is the real challenge of development in the 21st century, okay? <laughs> if you care about development, then you need to be focusing almost entirely on the problem of rich countries. They're the dangerous ones uh, and the hard ones. Now, let's take a look at, um, at the challenge that lies before us in terms of climate change specifically. The IPCC report that came out two years ago on what it will take to stay under 1.5 degrees is very clear. And it, has, it came with this diagram, which shows um, historical emissions rising on the left, and then um, the, uh, the rate of decline that we need to achieve to stay under 1.5 degrees. What you see is we, we have to cut emissions in half in 10 years and reach zero by 2050, okay? It's an extraordinarily steep rate of, rate of decline. Um, a total reversal of our existing uh, trajectory as a civilization, right? I can't emphasize that enough. Now, keep in mind, and this is crucial, that uh, for high income nations, it has to be much faster than this. The 2050 target is, uh, is a global average target. Under the Paris Agreement, it's acknowledged that high income nations have contributed the vast majority of historical emissions are responsible for reducing emissions much more quickly. According to, to scientists at the Stockholm Environment Institute, that means cutting emissions to zero, ending fossil fuel use uh, by 2030, right? Um, uh, which is an extraordinary fast rate of, of decline. So the question is, can this be done? Theoretically, it can, yes, uh, with something like a Green New Deal, right? So this is a shift away from the old failed market uh, orientation um, you know, the market's going to solve the problem, blah, blah, that's failed. Now we're shifting towards a more policy-directed approach, Green New Deal policy, which is basically actively scale down fossil fuels and rapidly roll out renewable energy, right? This has to be a policy-directed intervention. Now, the question that, uh, uh, in fact, is more specific than that, and it is, can we do this while still growing the global economy at the same time? Now, the reason this is difficult is because 3% um, annual growth, which is our existing target range, uh, means roughly doubling the size of the, of the global economy every 23 years, or by the middle of the century, roughly, roughly tripling it, okay? By the end of the century, roughly 11 times larger than it is at the beginning. It's a very fast rate. I mean, this is an exponential rate of increase, right? <clears throat> and the problem with, with growth is that it comes with an increase in energy demands. I mean, energy and GDP are very tightly coupled. And so um, the question is, can we decarbonize the entire global economy by 2050 while at the same time tripling its size? Okay, in terms of the energy demand that's required, it's a little bit more than doubling its size. Now, all of the existing models that have explored this question say the answer is no. And the reason is because uh, the more energy you use, the more difficult it is to roll out enough renewable alternatives to cover that energy demand in the short time we have left. So it's kind of like, um, it's like running, it's like trying to run up a down escalator, right? I mean, the, the forces that are moving against you are constantly uh, eroding your gains, okay? Um, it, it makes your job much more difficult than it otherwise would be in a, in a scenario of stable energy use or declining energy use. So how, so how, does, the, how, um, how does the IPCC recommend that we, that we accomplish this? <clears throat> they argue um, in their leading, uh, their leading scenario in 2018, this requires that we significantly scale down material production and consumption in high income, in high income nations. Okay. Uh, now, why would you focus on reducing resource use um, when, you're, when your concern is climate change. The reason is because reducing resource use reduces total energy demand. Why? Because it takes a vast amount of energy to extract and produce and transport and consume and process all of the material stuff that our global economy uses. Um, so the less of that you do, the less energy your, your economy uses, uh, and the easier it is for you to transition to renewables in a very short period of time. Um, if, you, if you have a declining resource use um, and declining energy use, then you can accomplish a renewable transition in a matter of years, not decades or centuries, <laughs> okay? Um, and so this, this becomes absolutely critical to our objectives here. And this is, this is known as degrowth. Now, the technical definition of degrowth is something like this. It's a planned downscaling of resource and energy use designed to bring the economy back into balance with the living world and to enable a rapid transition to renewables in a safe, just, and equitable way right? So social justice and equity are, are absolutely crucial to degrowth scenarios. Um, 
Now, the good news is that degrowth can be accomplished while at the same time improving people's lives and advancing human progress, right? Um, and the reason is because there's virtually, there's very little relationship between GDP and, um, and social outcomes. Okay. Past a certain point, that relationship absolutely breaks down. Um, and that point is somewhere between 5,000 and, and 10 or 12,000 uh, um, uh, dollars per capita in terms of GDP. Uh, and so rich nations, of course, vastly exceeded that point um, uh, and, and are now at a point where additional gains in GDP actually add nothing in and of themselves to, um, to, uh, to social outcomes. So what does degrowth look like in terms of policy? And this is where I'm going to finish. Um, and I'm not going to, going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, uh, but, but first, I just want to mention, like, uh, so if it's not GDP that matters, you know, when it comes to social outcomes, what really matters is the distribution of existing income and resources. Okay. Um, and of course, right now, as we know from the earlier part of my presentation, uh, they're distributed extremely unequally. Okay. So, um, so the key thing here is, is not that we need to plunder the earth for more, but rather that we need to share what we already have more fairly. Okay. And of course, invest in universal public goods. And so the principles of degrowth are effectively as follows, just very briefly. Um, the first thing is to abandon GDP growth as a political objective, right? Right now, GDP growth is, is, the, is the main objective of the vast majority of governments um, uh, on the planet, okay, with very few exceptions. Um, uh, again, the assumption is that GDP is a proxy for human welfare, and all, and all governments want to maximize human welfare. Well, in fact, um, this is a, a very poor proxy, and the reason is because um, GDP is a poor measure of economic progress. Even uh, its designer, Simon Kuznets, in the 1930s, warned against ever using it as a regular indicator of economic uh, welfare. Okay. Um, and the reason is because um, it counts gains from, uh, from extraction uh, and monetization, but it does not count the costs of, of that economic activity. Right? So if you cut down a forest um, for timber and sell it to Ikea, then GDP goes up, but it does not count the cost of losing that as a home for humans and, um, and, uh, and species or as a sink for carbon, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So um, we need to have more holistic indicators. Um, indicators that account for, for social and economic and ecological costs of growth. Um, now, maybe that's a single indicator like the genuine progress indicator, which starts with GDP and then subtracts uh, negative social and ecological consequences. Or maybe we just target what we actually want to achieve, like better wages, better healthcare, better education, um, and ecological stability and reductions in resource and energy use, et cetera, et cetera. Target those things directly rather than uh, mindlessly growing the GDP and hoping it will somehow solve your social and ecological problems, which of course it's not going to automatically. Okay, um, but then it's uh, now crucially uh, there is already an existing discourse being used in in so somewhat mainstream economics. People like Stiglitz and Amartya Sen and so on agree that we need to abandon GDP as an objective. But that but that in and of itself is is not enough, and the reason is because even if you if you, even if you stop measuring GDP in a capitalist economy, um, you know resource you know because it's intrinsically expansionary, resources and um, and energy use will continue to go up behind the scenes regardless of what you measure, right? So we have to have active policy around scaling down uh, resource and energy use, and what does that mean? It means um, thinking, ha having open democratic conversation about what parts of the economy um, have grown large enough and can be usefully scaled down. So parts of the economy that are socially destructive and, ec uh, and ecologically destructive and that we can do without, right? So say for example, advertising um, or the production of SUVs or private jets um, or arms, for example. I mean, these are huge chunks of the economy that could be scaled down with no loss to people's well-being, right? Um, right now we have, and you know, to me, this requires a significant shift in the way we think about the economy. Right now we assume that all industries must grow perpetually, regardless of whether or not we actually need them. It's actually, it's, it's wild when you think about it. Uh, we need to have a conversation about, um, a, you know, more rational conversation about which parts of the economy we actually need to grow and which don't. Um, as we do that, of course, our economies will require less labor. And that, I think, is a good thing. Uh, now, the reason we worry about that is because, and this is one of the reasons we continually pursue growth, is because we worry about unemployment. But, we, but instead of using growth to solve unemployment, which is our present strategy, we can simply shorten the working week as we scale down unnecessary economic activity, shorten the working week, um, and share existing necessary labor more fairly. Okay? Um, we can introduce a job guarantee and, training, and tra training programs to ensure that people can be moved from unnecessary sectors like advertising and arms into sectors that are important, like care and 
um, and, uh, and you know, the renewable transition, okay? This has remarkable, by the way, remarkable benefits in terms of um, mental health, in terms of uh, gender equality, um, uh, and, and you know, community cohesion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, crucially, also, we have to distribute income more fairly. Now, again, I mean, you know, the argument that, cap that capital is used for so long is that we can avoid um, conflicts over, uh, over, um, over distribution simply by growing the pie. Well, you know, in an ecological crisis where we cannot grow the pie continually, then we have to have a real conversation about how we distribute existing income and opportunities. Um, we don't need to plunder the earth for more if we can share what we already have more fairly. Uh, and this is a crucial part of the work that I do. Um, now, part of this also um, uh, needs to be about decommodification of key public services, okay? Now, the reason for this is that um, the more we can expand access to the things that people need to live well, like uh, universal health care, education, um, affordable housing, public transportation, et cetera, the more people can live flourishing lives without needing um, ever growing higher, you know, uh, private incomes to do so. So imagine that you live in the United States and you, you have to pay for private health care and, you know, extremely high rates of um, tuition for higher education. Uh, you're going to need a lot of private income to do so. You've got to work quite a lot, earn a lot of money just to live a decent life. If you live in Finland, then where you get these things for free, more or less, uh, then, um, then you can afford to work a lot less and produce a lot less, put less pressure on the environment while still, you know, living a, 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 a flourishing life. So, um, so decommodification and commons becomes really essential to enabling flourishing lives for all um, within ecological boundaries. Uh, we also need to cancel debts. Uh, and the reason here is because debts are a major driver of ecological breakdown. Debts come with interest. Um, interest is an exponential function. To pay down exponentially rising interests, then you have to um, extract and produce and earn um, ever more to do so. Uh, so by canceling unpayable and unjust debts, um, you, you take quite a lot of the pressure for growth as an out of your system. Okay, you, you sort of, you, you, you relieve everybody and give everyone sort of chance to breathe. Uh, we have all sorts of really interesting data on how households that are heavily in debt um, have to um, have to work and earn vastly more than they otherwise would need to, of course, in order to live uh, to live well. Um, so so, and this this is everything from student debt to household debt to, in some cases, state debt, particularly in the global south. Okay. Um, now, uh, as a final closing thought here, I realize I'm probably a bit over time. Um, uh, I like to theorize degrowth as a process of decolonization, and the reason is because when we think about the kind of um, of ecological and social impact that excess consumption in the North has on the Global South, it becomes clear that as you scale that down, then you, you release not only the planet, um, but also uh, ecosystems in the South and communities in the Global South from the kind of pressures that have been imposed upon them um, in order to feed the beast of excess material use and energy use in the, in the Global North. This to me is a crucial principle for justice in the 21st century. And so I think that needs to be a key part of the conversation. I'm going to leave it at that, and I'll take your questions. I'm sure that there are many, um, and I hope that that was hope that that was useful. Thank you.